So you grew up in Delaware. Yes. And you said that ever since you were a kid, you know, you always loved to draw and that you were into claymation even as a young child and everything. Um, did you have a lot of friends that shared your interest? That's a great question. Uh, shared my interest. I mean, a couple. I mean, there's kids like I was, a, I read a lot of comics and watched a lot of cartoons. I mean, honestly, my brother, my little brother Adam, was like sort of my partner in crime because uh, we we're fairly close in age. We we're only four years apart. And uh, so it was mainly like we were like latchkey kids. I don't know if people know that term anymore, but it was like, you know, it's a Gen Xer experience when you're a kid and your parents are off working and they leave you alone for a long time. And all you do is like watch TV and uh, and and you know get into trouble. So you know we were uh, the two of us would get home from school and watch animation and cartoons and sitcoms for hours, hours and hours. We would also draw together and read comics. And so I think my brother might be the main one that like sort of was like shared my interest in in art and entertainment, uh, which is great. And to this day, we just. And saw Batman last week. So, uh, uh, yeah, my brother. But there was there was other kids in school. But you know, I definitely was like strangely, bizarrely more interested in animation than anyone else I know. That's yeah. that's that's true. Because I feel like usually I have a little sister and she's into animation yeah. and stuff. And I feel, or any kind of creative path, honestly, I feel like can be. I don't know if it's different if you grow up somewhere like New York or something, you know, where like it's just like a creative, right. more of a creative and accepting sure. community. But like growing up in Mississippi, yeah, there's not a lot of That's kids. That's a good point. I, I never thought about that. That the, the boringness of Delaware may have uh, influenced my imagination. That yeah. I had to imagine all these amazing words. That is true. I, I you know, I, I, I know people that grew up in, in New York City. And I can't even imagine what that would be like. If like you go outside and like there's this much adventure to be had, because it's true, where I grew up there wasn't much going on. So any adventure was things we invented, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, that, that, that may be possible. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I all, the, the TV was like everything. You know, it was like watching TV and movies on TV was like, that was the, the big, like that was like my reason for getting up every day. It was really exciting to watch cartoons and watch. watch you said watch that you like Looney Tunes, yeah. early Disney. Yeah. I know you're a fan of comics. Yeah, I was. I, I was reading a lot of comics. Everything from you know, uh, comedy like silly stuff like you know Far Side and Calvin and Hobbes and uh, Peanuts. I love Peanuts. I love Garfield. To this day, I'm a big Garfield fan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and people are often surprised by that, but I, I love Garfield. Uh, I think he's pretty hilarious. And uh, so there was all that stuff. Comics. I used to, I was one of those kids that like cut. There was you know cut the like uh, comic strips out of the paper, and I would like get my favorite ones and like build my own books, like glue them together and you build my own books too. of all that. Did you? Yeah, with uh, like magazines, with fashion magazines. Well, yeah. For me, it was comics and cartoons, and I, I was like making this like my ultimate book of all the best comics and building them together so uh so i did that and then i you know i, w I watched every i mean the other thing about <clears throat> growing up as a gen xer is like you watched things not because you chose to you would watch things because they were on yeah. like that was the, it was because there, so there wasn't true. that many channels i mean there was like you know i don't know when we had cable so i don't know maybe we had like 50 60 channels but like it was like if you, you would turn on the TV and whatever was on, you would watch that, right? So that's why, you know, like, you know, I, whatever. I was like a, you know, whatever, 13-year-old, like, kid in Delaware, and I was like a giant, like, Golden Girls fan. You know what I mean? <laughs> it was like, that was not my demographic. It yeah. was about, like, you know, older ladies and, Flor you know, Floridian mm -hmm. ladies, uh, you know. And it was like, at a retirement home, and it was like, that was like my favorite show. Now, what I've ever chose, what I've ever, like, as a 13-year-old boy in Delaware being like, oh, you know, what am I going to watch today? Oh, let me watch this, you know, show about Floridian Retirement Home. No, I never would have chosen it, but it was on TV, so I watched it. So that's why I feel like I have a very wide-ranging uh, uh, world of interests from, about yeah, well, like, you know, they would play, and the, the other thing is, like, they would play, you know, I would see all the original Looney Tunes cartoons, mm -hmm. you know, I have encyclopedic knowledge 
of all of those, you know, from the 40s all the way up to like the kind of the crappy ones from the 80s, like all that stuff. Uh, I watched everything that was on like that. I watched, you know, they would play classic Disney. I had HBO, so like they would play some of the Disney films, so I got to see all of those. And I also would go see those in the theater. But, you know, but then also, you know, I was a child of the 80s, so I was ingesting all of that garbage, you know? Are I mean, you into like heavy metal? Right. Heavy Metal Magazine? That yes. was too old for me when I was okay. a kid. I or wasn't, like the movie? In, in high school and college, Heavy Metal movie was huge. Yeah. Like, it was giant. You're like, that's when I got into the heavier. I was already, like, smoking weed and, like, watching, <laughs> like, stoner movies, like The Wall and, and, and Heavy Metal. And, like, that was, like, like, high school and college. But, like, when I was a kid, like, I think like the most formative years, you know, elementary school, you know, uh, middle school, that's when I was just like seeing everything for the first time. That was like Looney Tunes, Disney, and then like uh, like in the '80s, it was like He-Man, uh, GI Joe, Transformers, you know, Ninja Turtles, like all that stuff. They were just kind of churning out, and even though that stuff was pretty uh, terrible, like I think looking back on it, like I, I I've referenced that stuff a lot, you know. So I, I've actually because people go like. Oh, you know what was great? They don't make things like Transformers anymore. They, they don't think make things like G.I. Joe anymore. Those were the best days. And you're like, no, no, go back and watch them. They're really <laughs> bad. They're genuinely terrible really cartoons. Good. They're not well constructed. They're made to sell toys. Like, they weren't good. That being said, things that aren't good for you are also quite nourishing and exciting and influential to you. You know what I mean? It's like cereal, you know? So, you know, even though those weren't really the best made cartoons, they still influenced me probably as much as Looney Tunes and Disney did for like a lot of other reasons. And I think that if you watch like Adult Swim, like I think a lot of Adult Swim is people like me that were like, their formative years were watching, so look at Space Ghost, Coast to Coast. I mean, it was like, you know, basically like made from like those terrible Hanna-Barbera cartoons you know what I mean? And it was like sort of like deconstructed and reconstructed into this like new form of comedy. So I think there was a lot of people in Adult Swim that were like me that grew up in the 80s and were like seeing like just this onslaught of cartoons with varying range of quality uh, and all of it just went into like the mix and it's just made me who I am yeah. today. I also love that you just said that when you were a kid, you used to kind of curate your own magazine. <laughs> because it kind of is so fitting to what you're doing today. Sure. You're curating yeah. an entire, you know, animation studio of what you, you yeah. know, what is your vision. Well, that's, I mean, I've always been like that. And I mean, there's, there's, you know, a reason why, you know, I was like ambitious slash foolish slash dumb enough to start a studio at age like 21. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not many people do that and definitely not many people keep doing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, just, that's the kind of kid I always was. I think it helped that my parents were always very, very encouraging mm -hmm. for like everything I did. Like any wacky idea I had, they were like, oh yeah, you should keep doing that. Or like, how can we help you do that? Like, it's like, like you mentioned, like claymation. Like that was like my first, some of my first animation was just literally, I had a camera, not unlike this one, where it just like, you push a button, you know what I mean? It was like a home video camera. Mm -hmm. And I realized that like, oh, if I push the button really fast, like it'll just take like a blip of a frame. You know what I mean? And then I was like, I have this clay, you know, that like, it's like Play-Doh. And it's like, if I move, if I do it really quick, move it, do it really quick, move it. Like I was like, it looks like it's actually alive. I, that was like, this was not somebody told me how to do this stuff. I did that actually with Legos. Yeah. I used to make Lego Legos movies Legos are great like to animate, obviously. The same way. Yeah. So not claymation, plastic nation. That's funny. Um, yeah, so like, so kind of delving into that. So, so it was like doing claymation and then, you know, you know, we were talking earlier, you know, the, you know, I was drawing on, you know, whatever, crayons, like from the, I can't ever, people ask like, oh, when did you start being an artist? It's like, I can't remember a time I wasn't, you know, because I was always drawing, whether it was crayons or collage, whatever it was, I was always doing something creative. Did you always, though, think that it was possible to have a profession or make a living out of doing your art? I don't think I thought about it as a profession, but I definitely, I definitely always had a drive to make things. Mm -hmm. Like, that was always, 
it's been a strong drive with me since I was little. And kind of to your point about, you know, a, what kind of kid would like put like rather than just going, oh, I really like reading comics, would be like, I'm gonna construct like the greatest comic book of all time by combining all my favorite comics. Like I was always like that. You know, it's like when when I was in uh, middle school. You know, I love comics, it was like my favorite thing. So I started drawing my own comics and then I started my own comic company. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I, I don't know if I would have liked myself as a kid. It was, it's kind of annoying when I say it, like it sounds like an annoying kid. But for me, <laughs> I was ambitious and I just really wanted to make a comic book. It wasn't like I wanted to make money. It wasn't yeah. like I wanted to be successful at it. I was just like, I mean, no, not many people would see the comics I would make. I would just make them to make them. You know, and then I started like putting them in my local comic store and like, you know, they wouldn't sell, but like so they were like photocopied at my dad's office at night. And so I was like making my own cartoons. I was making my own comics. And then by high school, we were talking earlier, you know, one another nice thing for me was that I was like, I grew up in the crossroads between traditional animation, you know, drawing things on paper, painting cells, shooting on film and then digital animation you know, where you can draw directly in the computer and do things digitally. Like, I was always doing both um, because uh, I always had a computer from when I was a little kid because my dad worked for Hilla Packard. So he got me a computer at a young age. So at the same time as I was drawing crayons, I was also using a mouse and drawing art that way. So I was always doing both so that by the time that, you know, I started uh, genuinely making animation, in college and then later in my studio, I already embraced both sides of the coin. I was already like, oh wow, I, you know, I love paper, I love the way animation has been made for the past 80 years, but also let me look forward towards like, what could I do, how could I do it easier? Because for me it was always about, the digital aspect was always, you know, how can I make more animation and easier? Like I just want to be able to make as many cartoons as I can. Yeah. And, then, and then when I realized like, oh, I could do it on a computer, I don't have to like, you know, wait a lot, you know, I don't have to buy cells, I don't have to paint them, I don't have to wait for film to develop, like I can just make them. That was really exciting. So, um, the last thing I'll say about that aspect of my life was that like, in high school, you know, I, I was kind of like extroverted, also introverted, so like, you know, I did like going out and doing a bunch of stuff, and but then I also had this side of me that like, I would just be obsessively drawing, and I would go home every day and just create animation on my computer. So by the time I graduated high school, I had like a whole series that I created that no one had ever seen. Um, it was almost like a Henry Darger kind of thing where I was just like by myself creating these things that no one was seeing. And I made like, I think four episodes of a show that was like an animated show called The Schmoo, which was like, um, it was like a, it was based on the clay that I first shot, right? Mm -hmm. Like I adapted it for 2D animation. I took, the, it was like a purple blob of clay. And then I drew it in my computer. Like, and it was like a, a character that was like a blob of clay that would like do stuff and go on adventures. So by the time I graduated, I was going to colleges to interview. I had a animated series. And like the schools were like, wait a minute, are you serious? Like you, like, cause so kid, a lot of kids would have like tests and things like that. And, and I was like, oh, this is the series I've been working on. They're like, the series? Like, oh yeah, like yeah. how many episodes? Oh, yeah, like four or five episodes. They're like, you should be teaching yeah, the rest they, of the class. Well, I guess. I, they, they were pretty impressed by that. So what, what was great was I, I got a scholarship mm -hmm. to school uh, based on these like things that I was just doing for fun. Like I wasn't really thinking that this would be a profession or that it was like going to advance me in life in any way. I just liked doing it and I liked making cartoons. Um, so yeah, so I, I think that all kind of is wrapped up together. Yeah, to go sure. back to your original point about what kind of wacko would make a, a book of, of yeah. their favorite comics. Like, oh, I love it. it was always, I've always like had the drive to like make stuff, but then also the drive to um, sort of create a construct in which I could make more stuff, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, um, so after college you worked at MTV mm -hmm. for a year or two, right? It was, I think it was a year and a half, maybe two okay, years. Yeah. yeah. But during the time, yeah. I mean, you worked in like the most iconic period of animation, I feel like. Do you like, think so? Yeah, like around like Beavis and Butthead and Daria and yeah. stuff. Or at least it was just such a vibe. I think for me, because yeah, I sure. was born in 93, that really, that aesthetic of MTV at yeah. the time was very influential to me. Yeah. And I just feel like very, kind of similar to Ugly Americans. It has like that punk rock 
happiness about it, you know? That's good. Um, can you paint that picture of what the culture was like at MTV? MTV during that time? Yeah, I just, it's funny you say that that was the, like sort of this golden age, because I, I always felt like I just missed it. Oh, really? Okay. Personally. But yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people feel like that. Like you get someone, you're like, it was just cool, you know what I mean? It's it's hard to like hit the exact moment, you know. That's but true, like though. maybe like when was Aeon Flux? That was like, it was I had, I was coming in right when all those things were ending. Oh, okay. Like Aeon like Beefs and really Butthead. Cool like they had yeah, it was all I, I remember uh uh my first I think I took a tour of MTV when I was still in SVA and I, I and uh, the creator of that was like in a room drawing like, that's him. Yeah. You know. Um, here, he, yeah, Peter Chung yeah. was like in a room, like drawing. And I'm like, you can look, that's the guy. It does mean fun. <laughs> but um, I like I I feel like I got there like the second it it got less interesting. I just mean that you were there. I was there though. though. Yeah, for you sure. Because like for me, like when I got there, they had just wrapped the Beavis and Butthead movie. Okay, they had gotcha. stopped making the yeah. show. Okay, um, gotcha. They were doing Daria, which I worked on, which was cool. Yeah, I know and, you worked on that. And that was that was that was exciting. Um, but I think I think they had wrapped up Eon Flux. They had stopped making the station IDs, which was yeah. a real bummer to me, and it was like my big um, uh, quest while I was there that, that never came to fruition, because I really wanted to do one. Yeah. Because for me, once again, rolling back to like, you know, being a Gen Xer, like <clears throat> the station IDs on MTV are just as influential as any Looney Tune. Mm -hmm. Like, the fact that I was a kid in Delaware, and I was seeing like they were tapping all these really cool like outsider animators, outsider comic artists, um, you know, that were like a lot of New Yorkers, you know, uh, people like Charles Burns and Kaz and all these people that I ended up learning about later as like as like underground cartoonists. They were doing these like, really cool underground animation for the station IDs, you know. <clears throat> uh, Henry Selick was doing things for for MTV, like just all these incredible artists. Obviously, Mike Judge. So they were doing these like really cool 10 second, 20 second, like just like dose of insanity that I would be, you know, I'd be flipping around, you know, like between Golden Girls, you know, it's like I would watch like Golden Girls, Electric Company, and then an MTV ID, which was some cool like New Yorker cartoonist mm -hmm. doing something weird. <clears throat> so like that stuff was huge to me. So <clears throat> going to MTV was like a big deal. But they, had, it, they, they. Had, I think what had happened was the moment <clears throat> that I went to MTV was like right around when they started getting successful. Mm -hmm. Like Beavis and Butthead was like an unexpected huge success for them. Yeah. And they had Flux too, I think, to a degree. But they started getting successful, yeah. with, and so they got a little less uh, daring. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> they were trying to recreate the success of, of a lot of the, the things that were hitting for them. They were really desperate to get the next Beavis and Butthead, which I, I don't think they ever got. No, oh, I think South Park <coughs> was the next. South Park was the next Beavis and Butthead, and, and they passed sure. on South Park. Yeah, and but, South yeah. actually, Comedy Central was gonna go under. I yeah. I interviewed this guy right. that is the largest Beavis and Butthead memorabilia collector in the world. <laughs> He's really cool. His name is Sean Beard, um, and he he told me about that. He had like this. Um, yeah this type of uh, snow globe or something that they gave all the employees. Mm. But Comedy Central was going to go under and then <coughs> South Park ended up being this yeah, crazy phenomenon. big unexpected success. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So so MTV didn't, so so it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. I, got, I met a lot of great people that uh, I, I'm friends with to this day. Um, and I learned everything about, you know, animation studio production, how the production pipeline works. Like that was where I learned all of that. Um, and then a lot of like what not to do, to yeah. be honest. Like <clears throat> I think that I, if, if I was more successful at MTV, if I enjoyed it more while I was there, I probably wouldn't have started my studio. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's like, what I'm saying. So maybe it was a good thing that you were. On I was desperately trying that. to get my own ideas out there and like my own way of creating animation, mm -hmm. and I was like, I, I just felt like like Chicken Little just running around screaming yeah. about like, oh, we should try this, we should try this, oh, let's do something like this, let's try this. We're like, this doesn't seem to be working. You know, it, again, it was probably very annoying, <laughs> um, and it never hit for me. Like, I tried to get the station IDs going. I almost got that going. I got greenlit, and then they redlit me. Um, you know, I did bop around. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm downplaying 
I think my achievements there because like I did, I started on, on Daria and then I ended up getting to direct the shows. I bopped around and like purposefully asked them to like let me try everything. I wanted to try design, layout, animation, um, direction. So I, I did everything so that I could like absorb. I was like a total sponge. I was constantly asking questions. Um, so I absorbed how animation studios run and there was, it was like a little checklist. So I was like, well, I like this, I don't like this. You know what I mean? Like this, this is really great. I wish we did this more, you know what I mean? And it was just kind of figuring and analyzing and processing that entire experience out. But pretty quickly I was like, I think I, I think I could, if not do this better, I think I could enjoy this more. You know what I mean? Because like working in a corporation, it's the only time I've ever worked inside of a corporation. Like I worked in the Viacom building in Midtown. And I did not like that. You yeah. know, it felt very um, stifling to me and a little bit um, soul crushing to be inside the machine like that. I yeah. mean, and not that I don't work for corporations. I mean, all of my clients are corporations. Yeah. But to be able to have an independent space like this that I can make it a comfortable place where, like, the prime directive every day is creativity, right? Because Look, I never set out to just make a lot of money. Like I said, when I was a kid, like I would give away my comics. I just wanted people to read them, you know yeah. what I mean? So the entire reason I have a studio because I like being creative, I like being around my friends, I like making cartoons uh, that I enjoy. Um, this has never been a money-making scheme. This has never been like, okay, how can I ascend and you know go to the next level of business? And you know, so it was always about like, let me make more of an art collective where I can make animation in a fun way that I enjoy it and I can constantly push myself and be more creative. And sometimes that drive does not match up with like what's going to make the most money for the company, right? It's like, look at MTV. It's like, I don't fault them. Like they had a big company with hundreds and hundreds of people and you have to keep paying the rent, you know what I mean? And it's like, once you like make your, once your overhead is that high and you're building and you're growing and you're expanding, well, you gotta get more projects that are going to keep the money flowing right yeah. on, a, on a on a significant level so of course they were obsessed with wow we just got hyper successful with beavis and butthead that was huge or we're making millions and millions of dollars let's keep doing that you yeah. know what i mean like yeah. sure that's great so um for me it was about like what i learned at mtv was meeting great people learning about how the process works and re and interpreting it and deconstructing it into the studio that I have today. And when you went off, you made the decision to want to go off and do your own thing. I know that you said that a lot of your mentors and bosses at the time told you that it was going to be the biggest mistake of your career <laughs> and that it would never be successful. Sure. Um, talk about that transitional period of actually going from MTV to start your own business did you ever have doubts? Of course, I'm sure that you had doubts at sure. moments, you know, whether this was going to work out for you and everything. How did you overcome that? Um, the, I mean, the, I think the reason why, like, of course, you have doubts. It's I just like, mean, like, moments of purgatory sometimes. Oh, you know, for sure. You're, like, well, in the process of building something and you're, like, you know, there's, it, like... You know, sometimes life is just a continuing process <laughs> of purgatory, right? It's like there's waves of... of misery and torture <laughs> and then there's the glimmers of, of wonderfulness I mean it's like that you know but this but yeah. <laughs> but like no but life's great like the life's where I enjoy <laughs> I enjoy my life but like the you know the idea of like starting a studio when you're that young I think the reason why I was able to do it and it didn't like the the the, the stress and the fear didn't consume me entirely was that I had no expectations. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there was and I had I, I had no one really to disappoint because it was kind of a crazy idea. I was like, oh I'm gonna start my own studio at, at you know twenty one. Um, and maybe it was twenty two. Around twenty one, twenty two. I'm gonna start my own studio and see how it goes. And I'm gonna try to make animation. And I'll see see what happens. And it was always a very low bar. There was no high bar to what I was doing because it was like, I wasn't like, I'm going to get a bunch of investors and I'm going to open an office in Midtown Manhattan and I'm going to get major league clients and I'm going to ascend to the top. That was not what I was doing. 
I was, let me find a small space in Brooklyn. I got a couple of, you know, pieces of equipment that, you know, I've accumulated, you know, that I could put in a room and it's super low rent and a couple of my friends might come over and we'll just draw animation together and see where it goes. That was yeah. literally my entire ambition at that point, right? I never was thinking, oh, I'm gonna have the largest animation studio in the company, I'm gonna be the next Disney, never. Like, I never thought that. It was like, let me find a way that I can, you know, make animation the way I wanna make it and see if we can make cool cartoons together. So, the fact that I had no one really to disappoint, like, because it's interesting, like, when I started my studio, like, it was 99, it, it paralleled, <clears throat> the tech boom. So, you know, for one thing, we came to Brooklyn when no one would open a company in Brooklyn, right? People, you take it for granted now. It's like Williamsburg is incredible, oh, right? That's insane. And it's like, at the time, when I told people in, at MTV, oh, I'm going to open a studio where at in Brooklyn, and they're like, oh, really? Oh, Siberia? great. Good yeah. luck with that. In Brooklyn, they have like offices in Brooklyn. Oh, yeah, you can get a little space there. Oh, that's going to be great. Good luck. <laughs> See you in a little bit when you come back. You know what I mean? And it was like, no, everyone was like, they would laugh at me. You know what I mean? And I was like, well, look, I, I was just looking at it very realistically. I was like, I can't spend that much money. And Brooklyn seemed pretty cool to me. Like, I liked it here. You know, it was a cool place to hang out. Why wouldn't I have an office here? And the thing is, Dumbo was just at the point when they were like, oh, artists, come out here. We'll give you low rent if you're big. There was a big, this is back when, you know, you would look for places to live in the newspaper. You know what I mean? And it was like, I would look in the back of the Village Voice and they had big ads that said, artists, are you an artist? Come to Dumbo. What the hell is Dumbo? Directly underneath the Manhattan Bridge overpass. I didn't know what that was. Oh, right. Know, right? Great. Sure. Okay. It. Great. I went over. They're like, you can have this artist space for like no money at all, mm -hmm. right? And do whatever you want with it. What do you want to do? You want to build stuff? Great. Build. You want to paint it? You want to put stuff in there? You want to shoot stuff? Great. Do whatever you want. So that's what I was doing. And, you know, it was just very like, you know, and I just went in there and we started making the animation. So, oh, my point with the tech boom was like, so at the same time we were doing this, even people, you know, I would meet other people that were my age that were making just gonzo money with tech, right? Because they're like, oh, we're starting these websites. There's these things called websites. And there's, I do these things and I do animation on the internet, you know, whatever. And everybody was just like, they were just dumping money on any tech company, anyone that was creating websites or anything. And I would see those people and they were just like investors. And I never, ever tried to get any investment. Like I just was always like it scared me. I was I like I don't want to be. That's the key, actually. I, feel I like think a so. Lot of I, I people say if you like to try yeah. your hardest not yeah. to get investors or people that you have to. Own, I, I, own I've always to. said that people are like oh how do you have a studio for so long? Like I've always attributed my longevity to mediocre success. <laughs> that like I've always out. just managed to make really cool shows and animation that I just really enjoy and I think other people enjoy but like I never had just this crazy over the top billion dollar project yeah. so I've always been able to sort of just like you know keep doing the stuff that I do so my point is that like I saw so many people that were my age just become like millionaires overnight and then lose it all and their companies went bankrupt Right, I would see. I would do people next door. I'd go, oh, wow, look at your space. They would have those spaces where they had like slides in the office, and you know these giant baskets of food, and like you know, and there everybody was like making. There everybody there was like rich overnight, yeah. and then a year later they were just gone. They were gone, and everybody was gone, and then and then the, and then the wave crest, and like all those companies went out of business. So again, like we're just like sort of like the, the, the turtle in the hair. We just kind of keep crawling along doing our thing and trying to be like forward thinking with the technology that we use and be and drive every project with creativity. I've heard also that is another common theme that I've heard for, you know, happiness and um, how to achieve, you know, fulfillment through creating art is to not have expectations. You know, in, in life, sure. period. Yeah. Because when you have expectations, nothing ever goes as planned. There is no always... No project, no nothing. No matter who you are, there's someone that is way more successful than you at what you're doing. Yeah. You never ascend that high. You yeah. know what I mean? So 
Uh, and if you do, I feel like you're not satisfied. With if you're going to play the game of comparing yourself to your peers, like you will always lose because there's someone yeah. that's more successful. Yeah. Everybody's jealous of somebody, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, it, it, it's true. It's kind of a waste of time. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about you have obviously been in business for 23 years. Yes. Which is wild. It is wild. You've created and helped to create so many iconic shows. Do you have one in particular that you're most proud of or that you value hmm. most? Um, that's tough. That's, um, that's interesting. I, I, you know, it's like I, I hate to say that, but it's true that like it is kind of like your kids where it's like I like, I like them all mm -hmm. and I do and what if it's like this for kids, but I like them all for different reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, because there's, there's, there's shows, like look, our first series is the one that people talk the least about, which is called Shorties Watching Shorties for Comedy Central. And number one, it was a watershed moment because it was the moment when we went from like, oh, we're just some a couple of people in Brooklyn making cartoons to like, oh, we can make a show that goes on television. You know what I mean? And that was a big moment because it was like essentially, you know, at the time when we started, we were making a lot of little projects, things for the internet, things for film festivals, like little stuff. And then somebody, uh, Eric Brown, who was the creator of the show, saw one of my cartoons, I think in a festival. Um, I think it was the first version of Drunky. And uh, he saw it and was like, oh, I really like this. Like, I, I just got this show greenlit. I don't know anything about how to make a show. Uh, I love the way your cartoons look. Do you think you can make a whole show? And I was like, oh yeah, sure, oh yeah, I, I know how to do that. I have no idea how to do it. Zero, zero clue. I didn't know anything. And we agreed to do it, and we did it. We made a show. We made it a whole series. We made 10, 22-minute episodes with Eric. And uh, <clears throat> so that's a really big deal. And like it was a moment I learned. I had made so many discoveries. You know, one, I get to work with all these really cool people. Um, I get to grow for the first time. It's like, oh, I got to actually have a bunch of people now to make this. And I got to figure out how do people work together? How do you collaborate to where people can still have their creative freedom, but then it also has to fit into the mold of the show? And I, and then it was like, oh, how do I make deliveries on time? How do I deliver a show? How do you process network notes? Like, you're gonna get notes from people, they're gonna tell you to change things. How do you change it without ruining it? Like, learning all of these things. It was just like, it was like 20 college degrees all in one experience. So for me, like that, and I also really liked the work that we did. Um, so like, that's like a really big deal to me. But then it was like, you know, the, the project after that was Wonder Shows in and like, for me, then what was interesting about Wonder Shows and was like, first of all, it's, I, I think it's not not because of what we did, but as the show as a whole, I think it's one of the most important shows, I think, in, in the history of television. I know that's a crazy thing to say. And, and again, I'm not saying that egotistically. I think the show would have been amazing with or without us. I think we did a great job, too. But I just think it's an important show. I don't think there's another show like it. I don't think there's a show that's been on network television that's been more anarchist and more nihilist, and I think that's important for it culture. It's very high acclaim. It's a great it show. Really does. So, uh, so then it was like, okay, I know how to make animation. Now with Wonder Shows, and it was more about taste level and aesthetics, and I was like, okay, you can actually push the envelope with animation, with adult animation specifically. Like, I'm, I can not just make uh, entertainment, we can actually edge into doing things that push the envelope, trying new things, questioning the system, uh, creating hard comedy, uh, comedy that like can be both funny, scary at the same time. That was like, oh wow, that was a big lesson. And that was like really John Lee and Vernon Chapman learning from them um, because they were so incredible as creators, um, you know, and the influence that came from them. So then it was like, okay, now I know how to make animation. Now I know that we can actually make really like um, interesting animation. And then it was like, uh, then that led to everything else we did. I and mean, we did Super Jail and Ugly Americans and you know uh, all of these other shows, Jellies. And uh, so then it was like, all of these shows like were important. I just have good memories for all of them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, 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 and then like, to summarize, I'll, I'll just say like, when I look back on all the animation we made, like I'm, I remember more 
like the people that I was working with, the artists that I worked with, and all the fun that we had making it, and the stressful times too, and the problems we solved, and the tough times. Like I remember the experience of making it, I don't see more than I even remember the cartoons. Like I, sometimes yeah. I see the cartoons, I'm like, oh, I forgot we made a cartoon about that. Like especially yeah. ugly, like we have this magic TV here, which loops like all of our favorite animation through the history, but then also we loop in some of our stuff too. Mm -hmm. And every now and then like old episodes of stuff will come on, I'm like, Oh wow, that looks cool. Who's that? I'm like, oh, we made that. You know what yeah. I mean? And like things of ugly Americans. I'm like, oh, I forgot we made a whole episode about like, a, like a conspiracy about birthdays. Like, the, you know, like so anyway. Like, so like, uh, so I really, I remember. I, I think the most important thing is honestly the experience you have in making these cartoons than anything yeah. else. Um, I want to also talk about working with Tyler the Creator sure. in Two Chains. I feel like that's gotta be a really fulfilling experience to be able to merge two cultures yeah, and sure. work with people that are very talented, you know, in their own yeah. creative fields. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really, I, two chains I didn't have too much experience with because we just did yeah. the animation for the commercial, so I, we never met him. But but Tyler, we, we worked with very closely for years because technically there's two years of the jellies, but in actuality there's three years because three seasons of the jellies because we did the first season for his app mm -hmm. um, and we that was like a self-funded thing where we like did I think we did like 10 episodes of that was the first season and then the, that that was what Adult Swim saw and they were like oh this is incredible like we want to make this you know for, for, for Adult Swim so then we made two more seasons for Adult Swim but technically we did three seasons and yeah, no, it's it, being in Tyler's orbit is an, it's an incredible experience. I mean, it's like the fact that, and the fact that we were able to start small in like just, it was just a few of us. It was like Tyler and Lionel is a, a really, really big deal in Tyler's creative world as well. Um, and you know, the fact that like the, the, like just unbridled creativity is Tyler. You know what I mean? It's like Tyler's one of those people that's like, he wants to make shoes, and he wants to make clothes, and he wants to make movies, and he wants to make music, and he wants to make animation, and he does all of it. A lot of people talk about it. Everyone's like, oh, I have this idea for a movie, or like, I think I could make shoes. Like, he just does it, and that's a really inspiring thing to be a part of. But it's like, he's a whirlwind, you know what I mean? It's like, when he would come to the studio, you know, it's like, he would just, like, scream, and, and you know, I was like, it was like so like he would like he shakes things up you know yeah. what i mean he would wake everybody up and push everybody it was like never like he was he would, it was always like whatever we're doing like this could be even better and it was like okay this is funny but i think it could be funnier let's like totally like rework it and do new things and explore new territories and you know oh let's we, we're doing animation let's make this episode half live action and like he was always he, he loves to push the envelope and that's just an inspiring thing to be around. So, you know, the idea of mixing cultures, maybe, but it, you know, because but the thing is, animation is that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, every everything is a collaboration, mm -hmm. and that's what's so great about animation because it's like, it's it's a it's a a, a, a mixture of so many art forms. It's like mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the few art forms that combines, you know, graphic design, movement, sound, music, acting. Um, effects like it's everything I all guess in that, one I guess in that so question, it's constantly sort of like a, a mixture of those yeah things. i think i just mean how it's kind of like a new phenomenon of rappers in right. specific getting into animated shows there's something you about, know in being creative I, I, I just feel like rappers in general are just ambitious like no, as far sure, as musical sure. art form like they're like it's like you look like the top actors are rappers musicians animation it's like I, there's something about uh, hip hop. That's just. But I mean, look. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big music fan. Yeah. And I'll say this: that like, I'm and I'm a, I'm a music fan. I'm a New York fan. And if you look at the birth of hip hop, it's like one of the most creative moments in the history of New York City. You know, if you look at like late '70s, early '80s hip hop culture, everything from music to graffiti to break dancing, like it was like, and it, it was like it, it, an a bomb of like creativity in New York and like you know when I went to school in the 90s we were just getting the echoes of that era you know what I mean like yeah. I knew a lot of graffiti artists and a lot of those kind of people and musicians so you know the fact that um, I think the birth of hip-hop was like 
we're going to do things our own way outside the mainstream. Okay, you're, you know, you know, learning instruments and, and making music the way we've been making music for 80 years. We're going to just like totally turn that upside down and like do DJing and, you know, reappropriation of music and like all this. And then like, you know, we're going to, rather than waiting to put our art in like print magazines or galleries, we're literally going to spray paint it on trains. Like it was yeah. always about like sort of bum rushing the system and being like, we're going to do this our own way and just creativity is the key. So it doesn't surprise me that like the sort of evolution of hip hop from that, from there, from like the early 80s to now, that hip hop artists have now sort of taken over like the creative uh, sure. industry doesn't surprise me. No, yeah, it goes back to that kind of like theme of punk, you know? Yeah, and it's like punk today, too. Yeah. Rappers are the new rock stars. Yeah, for that sure. That is who they totally. are. And that's what I'm saying is that it's such yeah. an innovative time because of that collaborative, yeah. you know, moment where this is happening and it hasn't happened in the past where, yeah. you know, members of the music community are intertwining yeah. with animation I mean, like this. I, I agree. Like, I think you can't discount with my studio. Like, we are a New York studio. Yeah. We are a New York City studio. Mm -hmm. We've always been based in New York. We've always been focused here. The majority of everyone that's ever worked here was in New York. And I like to believe that, you know, the DNA of New York is alive and well in these walls. That, you know, everything, all of my biggest influences are New York influences. Like, as you, you know, we just talked about hip hop and we've, uh, we've gotten to do so much great animation in that world um, and <clears throat> we also did a, a great uh, music video for Run the Jewels uh, who are incredible uh, hip-hop artists um, we did uh, punk is a huge influence on that and like you mentioned like the early days of MTV to me I equate with punk rock which is like you know MTV was punk in its own way because it was like okay everyone else is doing this we're gonna do this and it's not gonna look as good as what you're doing um, it's not going to be as polished, it's not going to make as much money, but it's, it's going to be more important and better, right? So it was like, well, we may not, I not, may not know how to play guitar as well as you do, but it's going to be louder and better and you're going to take notice, you know? So like, to me, the era of like the 70s and 80s in New York will always be like my dream era. And it's like the, the echoes of you know, bands like Television and Iggy and the Stooges and the You're Ramones Beastie Boys and fan, Beastie Boys yeah. is major for me and Blondie and, you know, the Dead Boys and like all those great New York punk bands, you know, it was it was literally a mile from where we are right now. That was where yeah. it was happening, right in the valley, right? And it's such a creative time and so powerful and so important. And then you have, like I said, you have hip hop going on in the Bronx and Brooklyn and all those things were going on. And then if you go back even earlier, you know, it's like you have the 60s and you have Warhol and the factory and, you know, Velvet Underground and like all of that world. And this is, all of this is going on within a mile of where we're sitting right now. That is where all of this is happening. And I really hope, and I believe, but I hope that like we're the embodiment yeah. of that lineage and that we're still making art for art's sake right and mm -hmm. that like we we're hopefully uh, paying tribute to all of those influences because they're my biggest influences yeah i think so and then the last question that i have is how do you define success um today in your life well bob dylan defines <laughs> success as uh if you wake up every day and do what you want to do you're a success yeah and that's what i do so I, that's not my definition. That's Bob Dylan's. But uh, I, 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 I would, but I do view success that way. I, I think that if you are are feeling uh, like you get to do what you like to do the best, and you get to spend time with people that you like every day, I mean that's success to me. It's 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 the greatest form of success because it's like um, enjoying what you do. Not everyone gets to do that. Like my wife always tells me that. Like. Cause, Sometimes when I complain about, I get stressed about things, like I'm trying to make this thing, or I can't figure this out, or whatever, she's like, don't forget, like, not everyone gets to do what you do. Not, most people can't say, like, I do what I love to do for a living. Yeah. That most people, and I forget that, you know what I mean? She's like, don't forget, like, it's like, that's, like, that's a really 
um, a special thing to be able to do that you can do that. Um, and and yeah, and it's like it's so I, I whatever I do, I mean much like to go all the way back to what you were asking about with the studio, you know, you were saying like you know building a studio and, and, and you know actually managing to get through the, the pain and misery of having to run a company when you have no idea what you're doing. Like again it was because I was doing what I enjoyed. You know, I was doing what I enjoyed and I knew if I fail, well, I'll just do something else that I enjoy and try to find some other thing that I enjoy to do. If at the moment that I if there was a moment so people were like, Oh, how do you run a studio for so long? It's like because I want to do it. Right? And other people I've known that opened studios and closed them, I don't think they particularly wanted to run a studio. I love doing it. I love doing, I love being creative. I love working with other people. I like making decisions. Um, so the fact that I enjoy doing it is the only reason I still do it. Because there are much easier ways to make a buck. Like there are so many, when, pe when I meet people, if I ever meet like, like students and they're like, I like animation, but I don't, it takes so much time. It's, I don't like the actual making the animation, but I, and I'm like, then do something else because yeah. it is an arduous road. And it's like, there are way easier ways to make money. If you're just trying to make money or be successful, then like do something else because you gotta really enjoy it. And I do, I enjoy, I enjoy doing what I do every day. And the, the, the last thing I'll say is, I also think it's interesting that to go all the way back to what we said in the beginning was that like, you know, I was make drawing and making animation since I was a small child. And I'm kind of doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's an interesting life to lead where like literally the same thing that I did when I was six years old is what I'm doing now. But you I know, feel just like that in an elevator way. With your purpose in mind. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, or I you know, I just uh, have limited thinking, I don't know. No, but it's like, no. I, I just, I think that's a pretty special thing that you can like continue doing the same thing uh, your whole life. It's I think pretty it's what you're meant to do. I have, I've never gotten bored with it. Bob Dylan is kind of punk too. Oh, he's, he's the original he, punk, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he's his own right. Oh yeah, he's, for sure. yeah, totally. He's huge. Another person that was making art about a mile from here yeah. in the village, yeah. right? I'm it's in the West Village right now. There so. you go. Well, yeah. Soak it up. Think it's all about there. It all the the energy is there. The energy is there for sure. Yeah.